thing today. Your lesson today is centered on economic defense of your family. Times are bad and will most certainly get worse. Bob Chapman is live with us today via technology. Welcome, Bob Chapman. Well, thank you very much. It's always very nice to be here on Tuesday. I enjoy it very much. Bob, I understand that 64% of Americans say they can't afford a $1,000 emergency expense. Unbelievable. We have depleted our savings, and we're in trouble. What do you think? Well, you know, i, I got to go back to 1959, and uh, that's when I started uh, in the brokerage business. And uh, one in 100 people had $10,000 for retirement. So the figures today are just as bad as they were then. Um, people have a proclivity to borrow, spend, and not consider what's going to happen after they retire, we'll say 65. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, the, the problem is that I think the Wall Street, uh, excuse me, Madison Avenue, and governmental propaganda has really softened people up to thinking that some miracle is going to happen. They don't realize that it costs almost as much to live the way you have been when you retired or before when you're working. Yeah. And how do I know that? I'll be 76 in a couple of months. <laughs> and so I know all about that. So you're an expert. And so, <laughs> what's that? So you're an expert. I'm, I'm, I certainly uh, considered opinion anyway. <laughs> but uh, I, I warn everybody out there, you may not be able to live on your Social Security. And if you have retirement, only 19% of Americans have we'll call it organized retirement, and there are others who have 401Ks and IRAs. But with the way the government is acting, they may want to legislate those savings plans, the latter ones, <clears throat> to the government and give guaranteed annuities. And uh, that's what they got up their sleeve. So uh, my advice is, uh, number one, if you're 65 and you're in good physical and mental health and you can continue to work as long as you can because retirement is generally debilitating. And you say, how can that be? Well, you're used to thinking and working all your life. And when you stop, what do you do? Sit on the porch and watch your, your eight-inch TV and, <laughs> and watch people go by in their vehicles or whatever now, that's not very good because, you know, when people get into their 60s, they have a powerful amount of knowledge that they've accumulated over years. And if they're healthy, they should continue to work. Bob, what, I, what I've noticed... Until you feel like it. Bob, what I've noticed is that people really look forward to retirement because they're tired of that daily grind. And then when they do retire, they don't live very much past that retirement. They just live a few years past that, and, and life's over. So you're absolutely right. Well, and Vinny, another point here is I have an uncle down in Texas who, Bobby's probably, oh, early to mid-60s, and he retired a few years ago. He was a salesman for a very large ice company, and I, last time I talked to him, he's consulting for his old company. He actually <laughs> goes around. He's like the fireman. If a, a problem pops up with, with his company, he'll go out and spend a couple of days, work with the customer, work through the issue, and he does that maybe once a month or once every other month. It keeps him busy, makes some extra money, and he's not as bored as he used to be, Bob. And I bet he went to them and said, please, find something for me to do. He did, and they, they obliged him. Well, I'll tell you, please, work as long as you can, and, of course, don't endanger your health. Uh, and, you know, with the new Obamacare that's coming and the cuts that are going to come in Social Security and Medicare from the new legislation on debt that was just passed, I mean, who knows what they're going to come up with. And so you want to work as long as you can. And there's another peripheral reason that most people don't think about. You've got children and grandchildren that can't get a job. And you may end up supporting them until jobs are available. Mm -hmm. 
That is exactly right. I know a young lady who told me she just moved back into her home with her parents because the economy was so bad, and uh, and she wanted to save up and be able to maybe buy a home one day. And so you're exactly right. Uh, a lot of people are in that situation where they're t- having to take care of children or grandchildren m- uh, much lo- uh, further and longer than they ever anticipated, Bob. That's right, and I'm glad you brought this subject up because nobody talks about it. And, uh, you know, for people who are elderly, uh, like me, uh, when you have uh, circulatory problems, use cayenne. And I also take, uh, I take a lot of vitamins and minerals and herbs, as uh, Vincent knows. I sent him a copy of it. <laughs> That's and a, uh, also meal. there's, uh, for circulatory, uh, there's Dr. Strauss's heart drops, which have a lot of, uh, of uh, garlic in it. And there's a whole bunch of things people should be taking. Uh, and you better get them before the government, at the behest, uh, which is the FDA, at the behest of the pharmaceutical companies, are going to try to stop all the natural vitamins, and they want to take over that industry because they want the money. Bob, you're- you know who's behind that? Rockefeller and Men and Mellon Foundations, the same group that's behind Let's Snatch Everybody's Retirement. Mm. Bob, you're absolutely right about that cayenne pepper. What I've done is I made a tincture. Class, here's what that is. You take some, um, some vodka, and you take the hottest peppers that you can find, green peppers, from uh, the grocery store, and you put them in a blender with a little bit of water, very little water, and you put some cayenne pepper in there, and then you put some garlic in there, and then you've got a, a real thick mixture, and you add some vodka, and then you put it in a jar, and you fill the jar up uh, as, as much as you can with this mixture, and you put it in a closet, dry closet, I mean a, a dark closet, and then you uh, shake it every day, and you, do, you shake it every day for 60 days. Then you strain it with a coffee filter after 60 days, and you can put a couple drops under your tongue, and you won't believe how that uh, affects and opens up your capillaries and arteries. It's just awesome. And that's what you're talking about, isn't it, Bob? You know, Bob, it certainly is. gentlemen, let's pause right there. We are going to come back to the USA Prepares Cooking Show with Master <laughs> Chef Bob and Vincent Finelli. Oh. We'll be right back on USA Prepares. <laughs> you know, I read about a Mexican citizen recently <laughs> who was going to Madrid. And evident- it was a woman. And evidently, she had been... In, involved in things that the United States didn't like, not in Mexico, but in other countries. Uh, she's a journalist. And so uh, she hops on her plane in Monterrey, which is in northern Mexico, and the plane heads for Madrid. And they're over U.S. airspace, and the U.S. government says, turn it around and take it back. Mm. And they made, they made the Mexican officials unload her from the plane and would let her cross American territory. And she had been over American territory innumerable times flying. They just decided that they wanted to harass her. Just thought I'd tell you the story. Yeah, uh, Bob, I, I, won't, I won't fly. Uh, I used to fly a lot uh, for, for the corporations I worked for, but I, I won't do it anymore. Bob, on uh, this, this uh, issue, August 13th of of the international forecaster. It's 41 pages. On page number four, you say that the stock market is oversold on a short-term basis. Long ago, we, that would be you, called for support at the Dow at 10,300 to 10,500, and that's probably where it will bounce from. The snapback will not be of any consequence, perhaps five to 700 points. After that, the market will break down to perhaps 8,500. I understand what you're saying, and I just, you know, without... Without the plunge protection team, it doesn't seem like the Dow would would uh, would be as high as it is. It it would be down at eighty five hundred, wouldn't it? Well, first of all, uh, it went uh, down to ten thousand six hundred, so I missed it um, uh, on the top side by a hundred points, uh, which is not very much actually. And then it rallied back uh, and uh, closed higher, and then it was off yesterday. And it was no a year, today, and uh, it'll sort of you know you like you throw a coin into water and it goes back and forth as it heads to the bottom. Well, that's what this market market's going to do. You might call it ladling. 
and uh, it's going to go there. And one of the reasons why is they don't want the market going down during the next election. So if the market has to go down, they, Wall Street banking, the government, would rather have it go down between now and February and then recover if possible. So and it, so that is the social political reason. The other reason is that the growth in corporate earnings, which have been astounding, are going to drop about 50% of what they were uh, this past year. And so with that said, the fundamental reasons for the market to go lower are there. And, you know, they're having more and more of these brush fire wars. They have another war that will help it in the downside, too. Um, maybe they'll take it down to 6,600 by February. Maybe they'll take it to 8,500. you got to play it by ear because they are so involved in the markets and manipulation. It's incredible. And most of the public doesn't know about it. The professionals sure do, but they don't know what to do about it. They try to pick the way that Wall Street, which controls government, makes the market go. And that's all they can do is guess where they're going to go next. Bob, you're talking about uh, corporate earnings. Now, where are the growths in corporate earnings coming from? Because when I studied finance and economics back in the 70s, I was taught that it came from you needed customers in order to have corporate growth and earnings. So who are the customers? Well, the customers are relatively the same but less. And so if you had to pick a point, let's say the dividing point would be 10. And not right now the, the customers are brought in 8. Uh, that shows up in the consumer section of the growth in GDP. And... It was running as high as 72% of GDP was being supplied by the American consumer through their buying. And, of course, money was readily available up till a few years ago, so it was pretty easy. Now, that number is around 70. And that number, I think, over the next few years, maybe sooner, will fall to 64.5% of GDP which is the long-term average since the Second World War. Now, if we go eventually into hyperinflation, that followed by deflationary depression, that figure could get down into the 50s. It all depends on how difficult things get. And so there's a lot of things that you have to put in to finding out what's going to happen. And that's what analysts try to do, economists try to do, Unfortunately, at large firms, they're under duress from management saying, well, we, we, we really don't want to tell people that things aren't going to be very good. So couch them in other terms. In other words, the reason that economists are wrong two-thirds of the time, which is astounding, mm -hmm. is because the people that they work for won't let them be right. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, and, oh, wait, wait, I didn't answer your question. Yeah. Almost all of the gain has come from firing people that has given them the better earnings. Mm. And offshore, uh, offshoring the, uh, the manufacturing and production? Right, and those earnings stay offshore, usually in the Cayman Islands. Mm -hmm. They're not taxed, mm -hmm. and, and the, those uh, transnational corporations are currently trying to do what they did five years ago, bring the money in, and not pay 35% tax, pay five and a quarter like they did last time, and government will say, well, they're going to make jobs. Last time they didn't. They took the money, ran the stock up of their company, and then sold their options out, made billions of dollars. And that's what they're up to again. Last time the figure was $350 billion. This time the figure is $2.2 trillion. Mm. Bob? And, you know, the yep. taxes that the American public will lose if our legislature allows that is $750 billion in taxes. Hmm. It's outrageous. Bob, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this question. I, I know we don't have time for it on this side. 
Uh, but on the other side of the break, can you think about um, how we can explain to our class the inflationary depression and then the, the deflation that will ensue and what you think the timeline might be for that, uh, for that deflation? That's a scary. all these easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, you ponder that through the break, and we'll be right back.